the morning new life. Let's get down a hand clap for praise. Come on. I am healed. Come on, come on. Got a story, got a story to tell About some things that I've been But I'm healed Oh, I'm healed Oh, I'm healed Add some ups Add some ups Add some down Level Level to the ground But I'm healed Oh, I'm healed Oh, I'm healed Had to rest Had to rest so long night Wondering what went wrong Wondering what went wrong But I'm healed Oh, I'm healed Had some sunshine, had some sunshine and some rain. Party, party and some pain. I'm healed. Oh, I'm healed. Oh, I'm healed. My God, my God, God has touched me, delivered, delivered. He said, I'm so. Come on, help us sing it. That if you believe that God 
Christ is risen, that you are healed of the Lord. And so you have to declare, I am healed, amen. And so we thank God that we have a balm in Gilead who heals us. Praise God. Well, welcome with the joy of Jesus this morning. I greet you. Welcome to our online listening audience, New Life Everywhere. This is your call to worship. Y'all seem a little low. Y'all got to get up this morning. Amen. I said, this is your call to worship. You got to be, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go in the house of the Lord. Let our feet stand within the gates, O Jerusalem. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Are you glad to be in the Lord's house today? Are you glad that you have strength in your body to come into the house today? Are you glad to be among the fellowship of the saints today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalms 25, verses 12 through 14. In New King James Version, it reads, Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Amen. Well, God, we thank you. We bless your name on today. God, we thank you that it is we who fear you. It is we who reverence your name. And because we do, Lord God, you will make us to dwell in prosperity. We thank you, Lord God, that prosperity is not just about wealth, but it is about wholeness in every area, Lord God. We are whole and prosperous in our lives, in our relationships, Lord God, in our thoughts, in our beings, in our total body. And God, we thank you and we bless your holy name for it. Now, God, would you come and see about us this day. Make yourself known in the midst of this congregation, Lord God, whether we're here, Lord God, physically, or whether we're watching at home, Father. We thank you, Lord God, for doing what you said that you will do, that you, Lord God, will make your place among those who glorify your name. You said, God, that you inhabit the praises of your people, and so we give your name praise, God. We give your name glory. We lift you up, God, because you are mighty. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of you are worthy of our work, our praise, Father, and we bless your holy name. Now, God, we ask you to bless all of those who are in here, those who are on their way. We pray over the word this morning, Lord God, that it will find a place where it will rest in our hearts, that we will sing songs to your glory, Lord God, and we will bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, and so be it. Come on, New Life, let's give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, let's give God praise in this, in this place. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Can you put those hands together? Come on, put those hands together. Come on, come on. Can we have a little church on this morning? Come on, put those hands together. All right, all right. Come on, put those hands together one more time. Come on, come on. Just a simple song that says, I will say yes to my Lord. Come on, put those hands together. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, the song says, I'll say yes to my Lord. I'll say yes to my Lord. He's done great things. He's done great things.
Can somebody just say yes, Lord? Amen. This is first Sunday, so we do our first Sunday hymn. Amen. Tell somebody it already sounds like first Sunday in here. Amen. Go on, stand to your feet. This hymn is glory to his name. Glory to his name. Come on, stand all over the building. Stand to your feet. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where from cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. I'm singing glory to his name. Second verse. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. I'm singing glory to his name. Oh, I'm singing glory to his name. Precious name. I'm singing glory to his name. There to my heart. There to my heart was the blood of God. And I'm singing glory to his name. Third verse. Oh, precious Precious fountain that saves from I am so glad I am so I have glad entered in. I have entered in. There Jesus saves me there Jesus and saves keeps me clean. Me keeps me clean. I'm singing glory to his name. Oh, I'm singing glory to his name. Precious name. I'm singing glory. His name there to my heart was the blood of life. I'm singing glory to his name. Fourth verse, come to this fountain, come to this fountain so rich and cast thy poor soul at thy Savior's feet. Plunge in today, you'll be made complete. I'm singing glory. give your name glory. Your name is worthy of all the praise. When we consider who you are according to the word and then lay that aside who you are to us based on our experiences with you. Your name deserves glory. We love you, and we are assured of the fact that you love us. You woke us up this morning, started us on our way. And not just today, Sunday, but all week long, you have taken care of us. 
and for that we give you praise. You've been good to us. Every area of our lives, we see your goodness. And so your name deserves glory. As we have come into this place to worship you, the music has been sweet. But now we need to hear your word so that we have instruction on how to live these lives. Say what only you can say so that our lives might be enriched. And now, Lord, we need to hear what you have to say because for many of us, God, we're in that low place. And for many of us, we're trying to make decisions. We need the counsel of your wisdom through the scripture to know how we are to live our lives. Speak, Lord. We're ready to hear. Speak, Lord. We're ready to hear. And now, Lord, you know the frailty of our flesh. We submit ourselves totally to your care. Hide us now behind the cross that men might see thee and not me. It is your son's prayer that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, thank you, Lord. Somebody who loves him, put those hands together strongly. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm glad you made it. Um, you better get that person behind you. Tell them, I'm glad you made it. And all of us are thankful to be in the house of, house of prayer. Amen, somebody. And God has been good to us. That is our word. That is our decree. And he has blessed us beyond measure. Amen, somebody. And I want you to know you are not here by accident. You are here by providence. And with the providential hand of God has you here. I need your prayers for Dr. Linda. She is preaching this morning uh, in Los Angeles. And we certainly want to pray for her. Amen, somebody. Grab Bibles, first Sunday, October. I think you will agree that the year is getting past us. Started out in January, and here we are in the month of October. Amen. And uh, God has been good to us. But the seasons are changing. And you're feeling a little cool. Amen. Are you going to feel cool this week? Uh, because the seasons are changing. Amen. We are thankful for the grace of God. Listen, if, if you really want to know what life is like, pay attention to the seasons. And as quickly as the seasons change, so will life change. You're in the summer of your life. And you can look up and be in the winter of your life. Come on, somebody. But in whatever season, God is good. Amen. I'm going to get to the text. Somebody asked me not too long ago, would I go back to the, the summer season? Uh, I'm in the fourth quarter. I ain't trying to go back. I, I like where I am. Amen, somebody. I, I, got any, I got any 60s in here that like where they are? Y'all awful quiet. <laughs> you, maybe you trying to go back. Listen, you're going back to a world unknown. I, I, I like where I am. Amen, somebody. That fourth quarter's good. Amen, somebody. All right, all right. I'll leave y'all alone. Second Corinthians, New Testament. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. 
familiar passage. The Lord really laid it on my heart. 2 Corinthians 5. I want to start at verse 16 and read through verse 17. English Standard Version. And then the Legacy Bible, which is really the New American Standard. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17. When you have it, say amen. amen. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Do you see that? The Legacy Bible says, Therefore, from now on we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ According to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. The grass will wither, the flowers will fade, but the word of our Lord, it will last forever. You may be seated. Amen. I want to preach from old to new, becoming a new person in Christ. From old to new, becoming a new person in Christ. Amen, somebody. From old to new, becoming a new person in, in Christ. Amen, somebody. Let me just begin by saying that 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, particularly that part of this text, not verse 16, but 17, is a transformative text. It's a transformative text. It's a transformative text. The goal of this passage is to put in plain words what it means to become new in Christ. For many of us, we've read this passage, perhaps heard this passage, or read in church, maybe heard it preached or taught, but we don't have a full explanation for what it means to become new in Christ. And I want to just take a moment, Joe, to explain how this newness for us occurred, what, what the death of Christ offers us and what life is supposed to be after our transformation. If you look at the text, and I know some of you have King James Version, that's cool. I'm, I'm right there with you. Those words passed away. Somebody shout passed away. It's a phrase that we use uh, often to, to softly announce somebody who has died, someone who has transitioned. Amen, somebody. We use that phrase because to say that a person has died sounds hard and insensitive because it speaks to the permanence and the finality of death. However, in this particular passage, the apostles' usage of the phrase passed away does speak to death, but the difference is that he is speaking spiritually, not literally, and then yet permanently and with finality. He says, all things have passed away. Are y'all hearing me? It means that a person that was living in opposition to Christ has died, and from that death, a new person has emerged. And usually when death occurs, there is grief and deep emotions and tears. But as the apostle speaks in verse 17, the language suggests that the death is celebrated because the death was about deliverance and transformation and a life in relationship with Jesus Christ, so there is no sadness. In fact, when we read verse 17, it is, it is the feeling and emotion of joy because the individual has the opportunity to live the life that God has purposed for all humanity to live. Amen, somebody. And, and, and when you think about it, verse 17, it, it is amazing how your life can change from being condemned to totally liberated. 
from having no hope for a good life to an abundant life and life eternal. It happens because of Christ. That line in verse 17, I love it. If any man be in Christ, it thoroughly explains how transformation occurred. It has come because you are in Christ, watch this, and even more because you are with Christ. When, when the text says in Christ, it means that your change of life, your spiritual transformation is a matter of choice. You accepted Jesus as your Savior and, and you, you became in Christ or you moved in Christ. But even more, with Christ explains his salvific work at Calvary that when Jesus died on the cross, you died with him. Your old man, your old nature died. When he was resurrected from the dead, you got up with him. Amen, somebody. In his resurrection, you received the opportunity for a new life. So whoever you were and the life you lived was defeated at Calvary, and Jesus left your old person in the grave, and then he walked away from it because it had been defeated. And now verse 16 of this chapter says, Christ is no longer regarded as in the flesh and you are no longer regarded as in the flesh. You might look the same on the outside in terms of the color of your skin and your facial structure, but your actions, behavior, and response to life is different because you've been born again. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus. Come on, somebody. The old you is dead. You, you knew from the inside out, not the outside in. Come on, somebody. Everything that represented the old you is dead. You've been totally made new. And now you have the responsibility, Q, of living in the newness of life and not returning to who you were previously because to try to return to your previous life would be unnatural. Because it's not you. No, no, no. It's not, it's not you. Because the old you is dead. You're a new creature in Christ. But what, what does it mean to become a new creation? God, God took on the task of, of giving those who believe in Christ a new life. This this thing is in my heart. The Lord, Lord just anchored me into this text, man. He, he, he wants us to see. Look, look at the beginning of verse 18. Don't close that Bible, man. You need that. Look at verse 18. All this is from God. I said God took the task of giving those who believed in Christ a new life. That's why the verse says all this <laughs> is from God. In verse 17, Paul explains who we are. He calls us new creations. However, when you go back to verse 18, it, it is the beginning of the process and what God did to cause us to become new creations. Here's what God did. He, 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 he reconciled us through Christ unto himself. He, he didn't count our trespasses against us. He made... This is God. He made Jesus to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what happened at Calvary. And so when you read the word reconciled, somebody shout reconciled. It means that God brought us back unto himself. But, but a better explanation is, is that he settled the relationship between us and him because we were in sin because of Adam's fall. But if you keep reading the text, we, we come to understand that, that when you use the word reconcile, it's that God paid the price for sin. It's that God was no longer at war with sinners. It's, it's that sinners could believe and become saved. And, and so now, not only did God save us, but he makes us new. God. You think about Jesus dying on the cross. God is in the process of transforming us, making us, do, which means he has forgiven us of our sins. But then more, he uses our conversion and the power of our witness 
to minister to other people. Because the transformative message of, of Christ uh, that has come into our lives and changed us can be used to change somebody else. And so he uses our changed life as a witness and source out of which we can minister to people who need the same spiritual experience that we've had. It's where we look at people and say, pay attention to my life. I'm not perfect. I'm just saved. Have I got any help in here? You, you're not perfect. You're just saved. And God did it for you. You're not, you're not perfect. You're just born again. You, you're not perfect. You've just been redeemed. You, you're not perfect. You've just been changed. Have I got any help in here? It's the reason why we don't trip when people know our past. In fact, we want them to know. Because we want somebody very to know that God changed my life. That God made me over again. And I, my life had been full of mistakes and error. But now, when I had an encounter with Christ, I was changed from the inside. Have I got any help in here? I wonder are there any change folk in here? That your testimony is, I made some mistakes. But you can't count my life by my mistakes. You have to count my life by how I've made it through my mess ups. Who am I preaching to? That somebody in here will witness and testify that I am new in Christ. Have I got any help in here? And may, that may not mean much to you, but to me, it means everything. Because as I said last Sunday, it means he did not give up on me. That he took a chance on me. That he looked at my life and decided that I was worth dying for. And on this first Sunday, what better message could we have? That he thought we were good enough to die for. Have I got any help in here? Not perfect, but he died for me. Made some mistakes, but he died for me. And then he didn't just die. God raised him from the dead. Have I got any help in here? He didn't just take my stuff to the cross. He took it to the grave and left it in the grave and then walked away from the grave. And whatever he walked away from is defeated. And now he gives me the opportunity, Ken, to be new in him. And I accept this opportunity and I join in with the text. If any man be in Christ, have I got any help in it? He is a new creation. All things passed away. <laughs> Behold, all things have become new. You ought to just nudge your neighbor and say, I'm a new person. I, I'm a new person. I'm, I am a new creation. Come on, give him praise right there. Well, if you're going to really live, and if you're really going to be new, he, here's what you got to do because passed away is relative to, to death. Somebody shout death. Yeah. If you're really going to live in the newness of life, then you got to release the one who has died. Release the one, come on y'all, who has died. Old things have passed away. We have to see first that, that mankind, and this is our position, is, is in Christ because God wanted humanity saved. It was his desire. I'll hand it to you. You don't have to turn there now, but 1 Corinthians 1 and 30 says, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. But don't get stuck there. I'll hand you another one. Ephesians 1 and 4 says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, watch this, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. I, I love Ephesians 4. It, it, it runs right alongside 2 Corinthians because that word in Ephesians 4, the word chose or chosen, means more than just being selected. Come on, somebody. It suggests that God selected us to be recipients of special favor and privilege. 
are y'all going to help me here? But when it says in Ephesians 1 and 4, before the foundation of the world, it means that we were already found in Christ before we were ever lost in Adam. You ain't hearing me. I said we were already found in Christ before we were lost in Adam. Christ was God's plan for the redemption of humanity. He chose us. I don't know how to make you any happier than to tell you you were chosen. It doesn't mean that God predetermined our salvation, but rather God prepared a path for us in Christ before Adam sinned. Therefore, somebody shout therefore. Since God wanted us and prepared the way for us through Christ, when you come back to 2 Corinthians, Duke, and get to verse 17, and you use the word if, the word if is not conditional, but rather confirmation of who we are and what God did through Jesus because it doesn't start with if. It says therefore. Have I got any help in here? Therefore suggests that as a result of what he says in verse 16, that, that verse 17 is the outcome. Y'all ain't helping me preach. Look at verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we were once regarded, we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. And then verse 17 says, therefore. Have I got any help in here? We, we, we are in Christ. And, and, and when we talk about it, we, 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 our newness suggests that we now live a superior life. What you are experiencing in Christ is superior to your previous life. Come on, look at the comparison. Come on now, look at the comparison. Look, look at, at your new life and new opportunities. Christianity is far more superior than how you lived before you got saved. But where, where you are now, what, what is available to you through Jesus Christ is superior to, to, to what you knew outside of Christ in the world. I ain't hearing enough folks say amen. That what you have is superior to what you had before. You got a peace that you didn't have before. You have a grace gift that you didn't have before. That, that your life lived through Christ is superior to how, Lord have mercy, to how you lived before. Is there anybody who will testify that my life now is better than it was when I was out in the world? And I didn't think that Christianity could be so beneficial until I gave my life to Christ. And I lived through him. I thought I was free, but I found liberty in Jesus Christ. Have I got any help in here? It's, it's not just my position. It's, it's, it's my personality in Christ. I, I literally became a new person. You, you undergo this spiritual renewal where, where your old life, somebody shout old life, characterized by sin and guilt and separation from God is replaced with a new life, but it goes deeper. Everything about you is new. Have I got any help in here? Whoever and whatever you did in your previous life before God, watch this, no longer connects itself to you. Your, your character and your personality, your behavior is new because in transformation, the renewing of your mind distances you from who you used to be. You act different because you think different. Come on, y'all. In your former life, you were led by your flesh, but in your transformation, you were led by the Spirit of God. But it's not just our position and it's not just our personality, it's the permanence of our new lives. The text says, if any man be in Christ, it's, it's relational, yeah, it's, it's, it's relational, no, 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 it's relational. 
<laughs> it's relational. It's relational. You're going to catch it in a minute. It's relational because it represents the sacrificial death of Christ on your behalf. Remember verse 21. You got that open? Verse 21. God made him who knew no sin. This is 2 Corinthians. Go down to verse 21. To be sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God. Let me say that one more time. God made him. Him is Jesus. Who knew no sin. To be sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God. He, he took his own son. Who hadn't done anything wrong. And put him on a cross. To die for us. A substitutional death for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Come on, somebody. That, that he took our sin and hung it on him and put him on the cross. And he died for us so that we could be in God's family. Have I got any help in here? And he gave to us the gift of salvation. And wrapped in salvation was the gift of relationship. And now we know God as sons and daughters. But our new lives are permanent. Come on, somebody. Because if the death of the old person is final and we can't go back to retrieve them, it means then that our spiritual change is permanent and irrefutable. The only way that you can change your salvation and transformation is that you got to go back and nullify what happened at Calvary. And you can't do that. You can't nullify the power of Calvary. You cannot change the effect of Calvary. You can't change the death of Jesus on the cross. Now that you are alive spiritually, let the dead stay dead. Have I got any help in here? You, you have to release who you were before you knew Christ. He says, they passed away. Which means you, you have come to the place where you have to bury who you used to be. Yeah, they, we ain't going to shout today. We, we just ain't going to shout today. Because we, we got to go to some cemetery. Because your old concepts about living need to die and be buried. Your old conversations need to die and be buried. Uh, relationships need to die and be buried. It's, it's fading on me. Old habits need to die and be buried. In fact, Ephesians 4 and 22 says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of living, which has been corrupted. 1 Peter 1 and 14 says, don't slip back into your old way of living to satisfy your desires. Let the dead stay dead. Baby, I don't care how you cry at the funeral, you can't get in the grave with them. Have I got any help in here? Because there is a separation cube between the living and the dead. Have I got any help in here? And if they're gone, the best thing you can do is, Gary, let them go ahead and cover them up. Have I got any help in here? I don't care. I'm not trying to be insensitive. But you don't want to stay at the cemetery if you're alive. Because things that are alive don't hang out in cemeteries. People who are alive don't hang out in dead places. And some of you are trying to be alive and dead. And the time has come for you to bury the old you. You can't shout hallelujah on Sunday and then cuss me out through the week. No, your cussing mouth needs to be buried. I'm preaching, but you're looking at me funny. You, you, you can't live that kind of life because if you subscribe to Christianity, then you are saying to the world that when Christ died on the cross, the old me died with him and went into the grave. And you look foolish trying to put on what you said was dead. 
Have I got any help in here? I'm not messing with you. You ever put on old clothes? KB, and they don't fit you no more? Come on, the, the sleeves don't fit you no more. And can't button it like you used to. You ain't hearing me preaching. And you want to hold on to it, but it just don't fit. Tell your neighbor, it just doesn't fit. And then you're convicted because you're taken back to how good it used to look when you wore it. You ain't helping me preach. You, you were styling and profiling. And you were cute and sassy when you could wear it, but, but, but your structure has changed and, and life has positioned you to wear what you used to wear don't fit you no more. And, and even though you would like to claim and keep it, you need to let it go because it does not fully represent the changes that are in your body. Scoot up, I'm trying to preach to you. There's some things you need to let go because they no longer represent the spiritual changes that have happened in your life. And here you are, but the sleeves don't fit. And here you are, you can't button it in the middle. And, and here you are, it's too short on you. And here you are, it looks worse on you. You need to package it up and let that thing go. Whatever is dead, let it stay dead. I dare you to look at somebody and say, just let it stay. Just let it stay. Come on, look at somebody behind you and say, just let it stay. Just let it stay. Tell them, let it stay. Let it stay. You pulling out old stuff. Trying to put it on a new body. Lord have mercy. Let it stay dead. I'm trying to move on, but the Holy Ghost has me anchored here for whatever reason. Let it stay dead. Because when you put on dead stuff, folk know it's dead. Okay, all right. Remove yourself, number two, number two from any environment that represents the old person. I said remove yourself. When, when, when God transformed you spiritually, watch this, it included living in an environment that represented your new life. It means that you have, watch this, the responsibility of discerning and recognizing everything. I wish I could put my weight on that. You, you, you have the responsibility of discerning and recognizing everything. Because if you're not careful, it'll, it'll pull you back to death. So you have to release things that, that identify with the person that has died because removing yourself from that environment takes away temptation. Can I, can I hand you something that, that I, I just want to give it to you. It's free of charge. I, I'm not, I ain't going to charge you for it. You need barriers and boundaries. <laughs> Nudge your neighbor and tell them barriers and boundaries. <laughs> see, see, barriers are protective measures that you keep at the forefront of your life. Come on, somebody. That, that no one has the privilege of impeding. Barriers won't allow anyone to deposit things into your life that will negatively affect your relationship with Christ and make you vulnerable. And you, you need barriers because as a new creation, the old you is supposed to be dead. But if you're not careful, you'll try to live a life where you're supposed to be delivered from. So you have to be conscious enough about your spiritual position to put barriers in place that help you to stay true to your change. But you need boundaries too. Because barriers are for, for things on the outside. Boundaries are for you. <laughs> Have I got any help in here? Barriers are for folks and things on the outside. Boundaries are for you. Because boundaries are those things that you have determined that you are just not going to do. 
no matter the temptation, no, no matter the opportunity, your personal decision is that I'm going to guard my integrity and Christian witness because there's some things I just won't do. Have, not for money, not for pleasure, not for notoriety and attention. Pleasing Christ and maintaining my new life is what I'm determined to do. I'm preaching, but you ain't helping me. Boundaries, uh, barriers and boundaries. Barriers and boundaries. You, you need to remove yourself from the environment that has the potential to pull you back to death. Look at somebody and say, remove yourself. Remove yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, let me illustrate it. Uh, I, I want to illustrate. I told you a couple of weeks ago that Scripture interprets Scripture. So John 5 and 8 helps me to illustrate this one. Uh, Jesus says to a man who has been infirmed a number of years, in fact, 38 years, rise. Take up your bed and walk. Rise. Take up your bed and, and walk. This is a story that I hope is familiar. You, you know it. Man at Bethesda, living in the company of infirmed people. For at least 38 years, he's been waiting on this healing angel. He's supposed to come at a particular time and season of the year and trouble or agitate the water so that the sick could be healed. But on this day, he experiences something better than some mystic angel. Jesus steps to the perimeter of his life and says to him, will thou be made whole? And then he says something that's powerful. He says, rise, take up that bed and walk. What, what is really interesting about it, and again, this is John 5 and 8, and it's illustrating uh, the point that's in 2 Corinthians. What, what's interesting is that, is that in healing the man and bringing him to a position of holiness, a wholeness, he, he tells him to take up his bed. I, I mean, what's the significance of, of telling him to take up his bed? Uh, it really shouldn't matter because he's been healed, but... but Jesus tells him to take up his bed for several reasons. Well, he has the usage of his legs, you see, so it means that this place surrounding him, you know, these porches and pools, they are for infirmed people. See, he's experienced healing, yeah, and, and so the taking up of his bed means that this place has lost its significance because it no longer represents who he is. It represents who he was. I want to just tell you, to embrace your new life, you have to remove yourself from the places and people that represent who you used to be. If it does not identify with who you are, then you have to remove yourself from that environment. Now, I'm not trying to get you to be super spiritual and I'm not trying to get you to be mean to folk, but I am telling you that you have to be conscious enough to remove yourself from people and environments that have the potential to pull you back to death. Je Jesus tells them, take your bed up, man. T take, take, take your bed with you. Because if you don't take your bed, it gives you the excuse to return. <laughs> to the status of being infirm. See, if your legs don't work for you, you can come back and lay down where you used to be. And assume your old life. No, no, no. Jesus says, if you can walk, you can't come back here. <laughs> Taking up your mat cancels the opportunity for you ever to return to this place. <laughs> See, when, 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 if, if we make this point a part of what, of what we need to hear, removing ourselves means if your new life comes with a degree of difficulty. You can't run back to who you were and what you did 
prior to your transformation. You can't run back and live with the dead, live with the sick, live with the infirm. You're supposed to have desires and an expectation for a new place in life. But if things don't work out for you immediately, you can't run back to where you used to be and claim your previous condition. You have to remove yourself altogether. And might I add parenthetically that sometimes when you walk into the newness of life, you will walk into difficulty because it's a total change of life. Sometimes in church, we tell folks that when you get saved, everything is going to be hallelujah. The devil is a lie. Sometimes in the newness of life comes the difficulty of the change from who you used to be to who you've become. Because you got to clear out people and clear out things and make a total life change. Y'all ain't hearing me preach. And, and some folk, you, you, you got to change and, and you married the folk and connected the folk and you're hearing me saying, Bishop, what am I going to do with that? I'm married to this person. Oh, here we go. And I'm telling you, you can't just walk out on the married person, but you are responsible for your own soul salvation. And, 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 and you got to be careful with that because, you know, when I'm preaching about the newness of life, I am not suggesting to you that because you've been transformed that everything around you has been transformed. No, that's just you. And you have to have the sense to understand that you may be a transformed person living in a house with un... Lord have mercy. And you need the help of the Holy Ghost. How to keep your light shining in a dark place. Have I got any help in here? Because just because the Holy Ghost cuts your light on don't mean everybody else is on. And sometimes the only light in the house is just you. Have I got any help in here? You walking around like a lantern because ain't no other light on. Have I got, you go in the kitchen, you the only light that's on. Go, go in the bedroom, you the only light that's on. Go get in your car, KB, you the only light that's on. Have I got any help in here? But let me just help you out. Even if you're the only light, let your light so shine that men will see your good works. Hallelujah in this house. <laughs> and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Have I got any help in it? Don't you become dark because other folk are dark. You keep your light on. Have I got any help in here? I got to be careful. Because some of you are in the midst of things you can't change right away. And you need the patience and grace of God to sustain you while you're making those movements. Because some people, Duke will tell you, just run on out of here and change everything, and you can't do that. That's why I'm thankful for the patience of God who will walk you through the process and get you to a place where you can make those changes that you need to make. Have I got any help in here? Tell somebody I had to hold on a minute. Tell them I was new, my life was new, but my circumstances were still old. Have I got any help in here? He tells him, take up your bed and walk. Go and remove yourself. Change the scenery and change the situations. It's about protecting you. Do you understand that? Taking up your mat is about protecting you. I am taking the excuse of returning back to dead places from you. And I'm not going to allow you to, to use the difficulty of the new to return back to the old. Because you got to keep yourself going in a forward direction. And I would say to somebody, because your life has changed, because you're dealing with difficulty, don't give up and don't go back. Keep on going forward. Because the more you keep going forward, life is going to become enriched. In other words, it's going to get better for you. Tell somebody it's going to get better for you. It, it, it may be tough today, but it's going to get better for you. 
It may be hard today, but it's going to get better for you. Because folks going to figure out that you've made a change. I promise you, folks going to figure it out. When, when you stop doing what you used to do, and, and you ain't making excuses for it, you just tell folks the truth, that ain't me anymore. When, when you get to that place where the old turns in life don't, don't matter anymore, you now go straight, folks going to figure that out. And, and you might lose some friendships, and you might lose some connections because folks were depending on you to be the life for the party, and now your life is in a different place, and, and you ain't as fun as you used to be, and you ain't crippled crazy like you used to be, and folks don't want to be around you anymore, but that's okay, blessed quietness. That sometimes the blessing is in being by yourself. Because the crazy got you in trouble. The crazy got you at distance from God. Have I got any help in here? You know when I have my most peaceful days, when I'm at home by myself, I don't cut on the TV, you ain't hearing me. I, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just tootling around the house. Alexa, play me some smooth jazz. Have I got any help in here? You thought I was going to sing down at the cross. The devil is alive. Ain't no sin in smooth jazz. Have I got any help in here? Alexa, play me some smooth jazz while I just kind of move around the house. I ain't talking to nobody. Ain't nobody talking to me. And I'm right where I want to be. Have I got any help in here? I'm, I'm at peace. I'm by myself. And let me tell you something, you can't really get in too much trouble by yourself if you're in the right place. I don't need nobody to talk to me. You call me and it's probably going to voicemail. Help me, Keisha. It's going to voicemail. I'm not talking to you because I'm in my special place. Have I got any help in here? Can I just, can I just close it? Sometimes you just need to be by yourself. Go nudge your neighbor and say, you're trying to have too many folk around you. You just, just may, maybe need to be by yourself. Maybe you could pray better if you were just by yourself. Maybe you could read a little scripture if you were just by yourself. And, and even if you have to put on some smooth jazz, heaven ain't offended because smooth jazz is in the background while you reading the Psalms. But you may just need to be by yourself. You in trouble because you're with too many people. Guilty by association. Have I got any help in here? I'm going to quit. I'm done. I've already kept you too long. Remove yourself from the environment. But don't forget, third thing, the cost of your newness. If any man be in Christ, he is, she is, a new creation. Old things passed away. All things are become new. Are y'all hearing me? It's expensive to save you. Like your transformation was not cheap. It cost Christ his life. Come on, somebody. Hanging on a cross, punctured. Wounds in his side. His wrists and his feet riveted to the cross. It cost him everything. And listen to why he's dying. He's dying because God wants more children. And the only way that God could adopt more children is through the shedding of innocent blood. Because we were born in sin. Come on, somebody. And so the only way that we could become the children of God is that we had to be bathed in blood. And so Jesus died on the cross. <laughs> Because God wanted both children. Have I got any help in here? It, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is the desire of God to have relationship and fellowship with humanity. 
And so Calvary represents Christ rescuing us. You know, if, if you really want to know, and I'm going to close it, if you really want to know a, a good understanding of what it means to be in Christ, read Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Come on, he is my refuge and he is my fortress. Have I got any help in here? That, that it cost him everything to save me. Have I got any help in here? And, and, and I'm going to walk in the newness of life. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be faithful to this transformation because it cost him everything to save me. Have I got any help in here? Your way of saying thank you, John, is not just with your mouth. Your way of saying thank you is in how you live. Anybody want to tell him thank you? Thank you, Lord, for saving my life. Thank you, Lord, for transforming me. Thank you, Lord, for changing me from who I was to who I am right now. If it had not, Lord have mercy, been for the Lord <laughs> who was on my side, Look at your neighbor and tell him, ask him, where would I be? I promise you I want to leave you alone. Tell him, tell him, I know where I would be. And it doesn't mean that I would be down and out. It just means I'd still be in my crazy. Have I got any help in here? I'm leaving you alone. You know exactly where you would be. And who you would be with. And what you would be doing. But if you got real good sense... You're so glad that he came and rescued you. Tell somebody I'm so glad that grace found me. I'm so glad that Jesus came and got me. Y'all don't want to be real. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Any new folk in the room? Come on, any new folk in the room? Any new folk in the room? Come on, let's just celebrate our newness. Any new folk in the room? Looked at my hands, and my hands look new. Looked at my feet, and they did too. I'm lighter than I used to be. I'm a new person in Christ. Father, we thank you for saving us, rescuing us, changing us. You did it all because you love us. And we want you to know that we love you. And we're going to give our lives totally to you. And be the persons that you saved us to be. Your spirit moves throughout this building. There's somebody here, God, who does not know you in the pardon of their sin. And then there's some who know you and they're trying to make a decision concerning whether they'll connect with new life or not or whatever they're going to do. I pray that you would move and minister to them so that they make the decision to come to you. Life in Christ is far superior than life in the world. And I pray that that message would emanate in their hearts and minds that life in Christ is far superior than life in the world. And I pray, God, that as that message begins to minister to them, that they'll make the decision to come to you. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, put those hands together strong. Listen to me. Listen to me. You're in this place. And you know the Lord is speaking to you. And the Lord is trying to bring you back to him because you're farther away. 
are far away from him. He's trying to pull you close to him. Not because he's trying to save you, you're already saved. But he wants to strengthen your life, empower your life, use your life. But you're so far away. Because as I said in the message, you are new, you are alive, but sometimes you can make the decision for deadness. And you've made some decisions. You kind of go back to some things. And God is calling you back to him. If you're hearing my voice, the other category of people in the room is simply that has nothing to do with you. It's just God says, I want you here. I want you here. I want you, like I want to plant you here for the sake of your own personal growth and development, but also for the sake of being a blessing in the ministry, total ministry operations of this church. I want you here. It's not about sinfulness. It has nothing to do with you being at distance from a distance from God. No, no. He just wants you here. And thirdly, there's someone here. You don't know whether you're saved or not. You've been in church, but you're not sure if you're saved or not. And it's time for you to have assurance concerning your salvation. Finally, you are here and you know you're not saved. You're watching me on the screens. You're in the room. But you're not saved and you want to be saved. You can be saved today. Don't let the people in the room keep you from receiving what you need to have. I promise you there is nobody in this room who wants to condemn you to hell or who's going to think less of you because you come to the front. I promise you, it's about you. It's about you. Hear me again, it's about you. You can stay in that seat and not move and nobody will ever know. But if God has told you to move and you stay in that seat, you're going to miss the opportunity of God for the life you're supposed to live and so I wish I knew I'd come get you but I can't because I don't know but you know God is talking to you why are you staying where you are why won't you get up and come and say God I need a change of life or God I hear you I want to be planted here because that's where you want me or God I need a sense of my salvation. God, I'm ready to give my life to you. Why won't you do that? Your life will be better. You said, well, Bishop, if I, if I turn my life over to God, will I have to give up some things? Yes. Yes. But whatever you give up is not going to be more meaningful than what you receive. Prior to Christ, I thought I was living. In Christ, I understand what life is really all about. So, here's my hand to you, my invitation to you. You can come. There's no condemnation. Nobody's going to look down on you, treat you funny. It's not about other people. It's about you. That's an excuse that people use. Well, there's a lot of people in the room. There is, but they're not, they're not thinking about you per se. The enemy uses that as an excuse for you to stay in your seat. But this is your opportunity to be changed. I wonder, will you make the move right now for a changed life? Is that you God is talking to? Are you the person that God is saying, come go with me? I want to use your life. If you're in this room, you can come right now. You've been coming and coming and coming and coming to church. And you've been hiding in the shadows of those purple chairs. 
thinking that nobody saw you. And God says, but I do. I see you. And it's time for you to make a decision for me. Is that you? If that's you, you ought to come right now. You ought to come right now. You ought to come right now. God's speaking to your heart. You ought to come right now. You ought to come right now. Forward. Say it one more time. You make all things new and you make all things new and I will follow you forward. And the people of God said amen. Come on, give God hand claps of praise. <laughs> to God be the glory for the things he has done. Amen, somebody. You are new in Christ Jesus. I want you to hold on to your newness and not sacrifice the gift of transformation for anybody because what the Lord has done for you is for you. Amen, somebody. I want us to prepare our hearts to give really quickly and then we're going to move to sacrament because I want sacrament to be the last thing that we do. Let me say it again as I, I tried to say it. I did not say it last Sunday, but I definitely want to say it today that I am so proud of all of you as you have given your, your tithe and your offerings. The Lord is going to bless you. I'm sure you are being blessed already. Because you have been faithful in your giving. Amen, somebody. And I am thankful for how you follow, and you do that incredibly well. Amen, somebody. And we just want to keep going. Uh, there are great things on the horizon. We'll be talking about that soon. Uh, we are in the month of October. December is coming quickly, so there's much that we need to talk about, and we will. In fact, in December, I'm going to pull us together one service uh, in the month of December. I'm going to, instead of preach, I'm going to outline some things that are going to happen in 2025. Amen, somebody. And I think that you would be excited, as excited as we are, for what God is doing and for where God is taking us. Amen, somebody. Uh, but I want us to continue to be faithful in our giving. And it's so funny. Uh, I had a sister who was going home the other day. I had gotten in my car she drove on the parking lot um, honking like crazy and I'm trying to say who this is honking because I don't recognize the car. Amen somebody. And uh, I had to reach over and get my sunshine. Uh, <laughs> because folk will pull up on you. You don't have any sunshine? do what you want to do. I have my own sunshine. And uh, I went down my window cautiously and screaming, Bishop, 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 hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and she said, I, I'm going out of the city and I just could not leave without giving my tithe. I said, bless God's heart. I thanked her for being so gracious and considerate of the church. I talked to her for a minute, and it was just my joy to share with her. She was going on vacation with her daughter, and I'm driving to where they were going, and she needed to give her tithe. And I thought that was so cool. She said, now, do I give it to you, or do I put it in the box? I took it into the office. But I'm thankful for that kind of stewardship. So many of you, come on, give God praise. So many of you have done that. And it affords us the opportunity to do what we do as a church. So I bless God for her and for you. And I want to say to you, thank you for being uh, wonderful stewards as it relates to the resources that God.
God has given you. Amen, somebody? All right, let's do this giving creed. Amen, somebody. I'm a kingdom giver. Honor the Lord with the first and the best of all I have. I am a kingdom giver. I give to maintain and expand the work of the kingdom. As a kingdom giver, I expect as I give, I will receive. As I sow, I will reap abundantly above measure and overflowing as I make the kingdom first in my giving I decree that my heart is content my needs are met and my future is secure Father we thank you for the opportunity to give you've been faithful to us and God to you we want to be faithful and so we give to you our tithe, our offerings. And God, we entrust it all to you to do the work of ministry. The world needs to know the name of Jesus Christ. And we pray, God, that as we give, you would use new life of Memphis to make his name known. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to give because it means if we're giving, we have received. And the fact that you have sown into us puts us in a position to give back to you. So we come now, God, in that, in that scripture. Now, you said you'd open the windows of heaven and pour. And we're ready for you to saturate our lives with your blessings and favor. We receive it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, New Life. I'm Ashley, and this is your New Life News for the week. Men's fraternity will be hanging out tonight here at the church for Sunday night football. Men, come out and witness the Cowboys defeating the Steelers. Oh, I mean, come out for food and fellowship and football. Things will be kicking off here at 7 o'clock p.m., men. We hope to see you soon. Leaders, this is a friendly reminder about our leadership meeting tomorrow here at the church at 6.30 p.m. We look forward to a great meeting. Join us each Tuesday for our October Bible series, Thrive, Living a Purpose-Filled Life. Knowing the purpose that God has for us helps us to live with confidence. When we are living out God's plan and desire for us, the reactions of the world around us has little consequences. Thrive every Tuesday at 6.30. We look forward to seeing you there. Bishop will be the guest speaker this Wednesday at Mount Pisgah Church in Olive Branch, Mississippi. Service will begin at 7.30 p.m. If you're free, come on out and support Bishop and the New Life Music Ministry in worship. Continue to stay plugged into our weekly scheduled ministry opportunities. Tuesdays and Thursday morning prayers on the prayer line each Tuesday and Thursday morning at 6.30 a.m. Start your day with Bishop each morning at 7 o'clock a.m. for Wednesday in the Word. You can tune in on all of our streaming platforms. This has been your New Life News for the week. We thank you in-person visitors and online guests for joining us. Have a blessed week and please share our posts on all social media platforms and subscribe to our YouTube page. And remember, here at New Life, we are transforming lives to change the world. Now you be blessed. Amen. Ashley, you got it right. You were just prophetic. <laughs> oh, praise God. I have said for tonight, uh, for those who are coming to share with us, I can say this part because this ain't going to hurt nobody's feelings. But, um, any of the men in the room who went to Dallas, hold up your hand. Any of the men who went to Dallas? I'm, I'm Hutchinson. Y'all remember? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Brisket is here from Hutchinson, Dallas, Texas. Now, let me help you with that. Uh, if, if you are a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, <laughs> the only way that you can get brisket is you have to put on a Dallas Cowboy jersey. <laughs> 
and we will have some for you. And you have to root for the Cowboys. If you do not wear the, the Cowboys jersey, you'll have to eat those nasty nachos. You see. So, I'm looking at Duke, but I ain't looking at Duke either. So, uh, you know, we got food and all of that kind of stuff. But uh, we did it because uh, we just left Dallas, what, three weeks ago, four weeks ago? And uh, we wanted to bring it back to the guys. But about that cowboy thing, uh, yes, that is not in jest. We're going to have several jerseys. And if you put that jersey on, you are welcome to, uh, yes, sir. You do not wear that jersey. We don't know what you're going to eat. He said, Bishop, you wouldn't do that. Hide and watch. I promise you. <laughs> my Lord, my Lord. Okay. Let me get spiritual. Let me get spiritual. Um, gatekeepers are giving you receptacles now because we want to make sure that we leave on the Lord's soul. We have everybody. If you don't have one, would you just? Okay. Song says, Calvary, Calvary, surely he died on Calvary. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want you just for a moment to think about the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. He died because John 3.16 said that God wanted fellowship and connection with humanity. He died so that we could become sons and daughters of the Most High God and enjoy the privilege of God. But because of Adam's sin, the only way that we could come into God's family through shed blood and so Jesus went to the cross and he died on our behalf I want you to know that every time we take sacrament we are honoring his death for us in your own way I want you to pray and ask for the forgiveness of sin Ask God to make you ready to receive this emblem of body and blood. Believers are praying all over the building. 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 Lord, how we thank you for sacrifice you made on our behalf. You laid on a cross and allowed yourself to be brutally victimized by men. Men who you died for. You died for humanity past, humanity present, and humanity to come. And you died because God wanted more children. And the only way that we could come into the family of God is through shed blood, innocent blood. And for that, we are thankful and grateful that you didn't come down from the cross, that you stayed there until our sin debt had been paid. And then you went to the grave, and Sunday you walked out with all power. We thank you for your sacrifice. As we come now, we are participating in what you told your disciples to do. You said, do this in remembrance of me. 
And as those who were around that table, we are sharing bread and wine, body and blood, to honor your death on our behalf. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Change this emblem from that which is carnal to that which is spiritual. And help us, help us to appreciate and, and honor you for your sacrificial death on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I say unto you, take ye and eat. His blood which is shed for the remission of sin, I say unto you, take ye and drink. Church, as you make your exit, our gatekeepers are in positions to take a position to take your receptacles. Come on and stand to your feet. God bless you. Hold on to the newness of life. You are covered under the blood of Jesus. Be careful this week. I want to see you in Bible study. Listen, I want us to end the year strong. October is the last month of Bible study. There is no Bible study in November and December. Get to Bible study. Amen. 6 o'clock to 6.30 is prayer, and we start promptly at 6.30, and we are timely. Get to Bible study on Tuesday night. It will bless you. Amen, somebody? Pastor Sherry has been teaching. I think I'm teaching Tuesday night. The teacher is irrelevant. You get to Bible study because you need a word in your heart. Amen. God bless you. We love you.